Hello, everybody. Almost a year ago, Theo Priestley and Bronwyn Williams brought together a team of 18 futurists to share their vision of the future. And guess what? I have a chapter in there as well. I'm super excited about it. We have some incredibly smart people who have contributed to this. It's a cool book. It's now available for pre-order. I make nothing if you sell more copies, but it's awesome and you should get it. It's coming out this spring, actually. And we wanted to chat with a number of those futurists, get some sneak peeks into what's in the book and chat with the editors, Theo and Bronwyn. So welcome everybody. Good to be here, John. Hey. Excellent, excellent. Super happy Hello, to have everybody. you. Bronwyn, let's start with you. Um, what is this book about? Why did you do this? Uh, why were you interested in doing this? And, and what does it mean for you? What's this whole project mean for you? Well, we started putting this together. It would have been towards the end of 2019. So before the whole COVID crisis sort of changed everything. So it turned out to actually work in our favor because times of chaos do tend to focus the mind towards the future once again. But the real thinking behind the book was that there's so many, there's so few actually visions of the future. And there's particularly few practical and positive ideas as to where we're headed as a species. In general, this course about the future tends to be dominated by the loudest voices in the room. So you get like a few of those sort of celebrity pop futurists to take up a lot of space. And you also have the very big technologists, the people who are literally shaping the world in their image. And we definitely were thinking that there should be more ideas for the future. Because from my perspective, choice and freedom are so closely related. So we definitely need more visions as to what could be happening. We need more people involved in those conversations. So thinking behind this book, The Future Starts Now, is to introduce some of the ideas that people like ourselves, people who are privileged enough to spend our lives thinking about the future, are already thinking about, and to present why we think they are important. So the people who read the book, whether they be professionals or whether they be business owners or just regular individuals, are able to get involved with those conversations and to start shaping things in a different way if they don't like the way the world is headed. Love it. Absolutely love it. Theo, want to bring you in here. You're the other editor and the uh, one of the other forces behind this book. And I mean, uh, you had to you had to chase me. So I'm going to guess you had to chase everybody here because we're all busy people. And I almost didn't get to doing my piece. Christina, just seeing you're joining there and adding you to the mix here. Uh, so Theo, tell us a little bit about your process of going through this, why you wanted to do this project, and maybe some of the most compelling ideas in the book for you. Yeah, so I mean, I've kind of toyed with with writing something before. Um, <clears throat> but to me, if you take on a book project, something like this, where you're talking about the future, and especially a, a wide range of topics, um, I'm not an expert in, 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 in many of the areas that the, that the others mm. have written about. Um, and I thought it would do this kind of idea a disservice just to have one person prattle on about um, various aspects <laughs> of, of the future, about education, money, you know, space, travel, AI, security, that kind of thing. So the idea behind this book was really, um, and, and much in the same way that Bronwyn has already touched upon, is that we all hear from the same, the same people, the same pop futurists. Um, we're all told what the future should look like by the people who are spending billions of dollars telling us this is what it should look like. And, and really, there aren't enough voices challenging whether it's the right direction. So the reason I said, well, I can't just do this alone. It has to involve a lot more people who are a lot more learned in other areas um, and give them the platform to actually discuss. This is my idea of what the future should look like. These are the practicalities and these, most importantly, these are the downsides. So I, I don't think there's enough challenge um, on the downsides um, of, uh, of what we're, of where we're heading, especially just now. Yeah, interesting. Bronwyn, maybe uh, pop back to you for just a second here and just ask, how did you pick the people that are in the book? Um, random people you grabbed off the street or uh, <laughs> people you knew? People uh, like you. How did you pick the people and the topics? Well, the, the topics we started off, like Theo and I talking about the, the big issues that we needed to cover. I mean, there's obviously things people understand and know about, things like data privacy, things like warfare, things like climate change, or sort of issues that everybody wants to or, or has some sort of idea on, but perhaps doesn't have an idea of the nuance that goes into it. So we try to 
pick quite a diverse range of topics that cover all the biggest sort of conversations that people could and should be having if you want to have a say in to, as to how the future is going to unroll. As to who we got to or who we propositioned and then um, arm wrestled into actually becoming a part of this project, the first thing we really were quite keen on doing is making sure that we had a good mix of voices, a mix of voices that hadn't necessarily been overexposed, people whose ideas we don't already know from just generally being internet citizens of today's day and age, and also voices coming from a wide geographic range of places. So we try to tried very hard to make sure that we've got voices coming from all across the world, from very diverse backgrounds of people. Some are more well-known than others. There's some voices that have never been published before that are going to be part of this collection. We got a young student, too, who Theo can talk to. I mean, he had to track him down, like us from the, the, the junior futurist, the, the Gen Z futurist, as he calls himself. It's also become a part of this whole thing. And we really just wanted to make sure that we are exposing people to the biggest ideas, the ideas that are going to shape things for better or for worse, and also the most interesting ideas. And that required finding some more unusual voices. So obviously, we dug into our own personal black books, but it also involved quite a bit of cold calling. So you get together a collection <laughs> of interesting characters who are going Love to it. be able to hopefully inform our readers. Love it. Theo, I'm going to ask you one more question, then I'm going to turn to all the futurists who are on the panel here and ask them what they shared, what they um, what they wrote for the book, and whether it's already coming true. Um, the thing that I did that I wrote about is already coming true, but I suspect that's the, true to some degree for everybody. Um, Theo, I remember interviewing you for my Future 39 podcast, and uh, you were on often on the dystopia side of the utopia or dystopia of the future. Talk to me a little bit about that balance and that thread throughout this compilation here. What are you seeing? Uh, how did it turn out? So um, going back, yeah, yeah, back to a, a point um, I made earlier, I think we, um, we are certainly being dictated to um, in terms of what the future should look like. And I would say that there is a vast majority of the voices in the book that would challenge that um, and say that it's not really, um, it's almost like a snowball effect. Someone has kicked it off and thought this was a great idea. And there aren't that many people actually saying, oh, hang on a minute, let's actually see and chart where this could actually lead. Um, and what are the downsides to all of this? So, you know, we relinquish our data privacy uh, on a daily basis and you know that ship has sailed um, but where is it going to go you know and is there any recourse that we can sort of uh, uh, backtrack on that front front so yeah i think w when you sort of balance utopia versus uh, dystopia you know you a utopian society is never going to happen you know i think we all like to imagine us wearing sandals and togas again and and living <laughs> the greek uh, philosophical life you know that you know, that's not going to happen and you know, I think the Matrix painted it quite well in the sense that, you know, we, we try, you know, the machines tried to give us an idyllic life or an idyllic world to live in. And we railed against it in the film because it just felt so unnatural. And, and that's probably as, as close to real life as you're going to get. Utopia just does not feel natural to us. Whereas dystopia, we live it on a day to day basis. And I think and I think what we need to do is challenge the degree in which we want to bury ourselves in that kind of world. Love it, love it, love it. I want to turn to some of the other people on the panel here. Uh, Nick, we're going to chat with you. Doug, we're going to chat with you. Andrew, we're going to chat with you. I'm going to start with Christina, I think. And I'd love to hear what you uh, wrote for um, in the book and what your chapter is about um, and what you're passionate about. Sure. So my uh, chapter in the book I wrote about cyber security and cyber war and um, and then solar winds happened. <laughs> um, and then I, I wrote about space. So I'm pretty interested in how we're going about exploring space and sort of like, where does that go? And the fact that it feels poorly legislated, the fact that we feel really poorly aware of, um, of what that looks like, right? Like, what does colonization of Mars look like? What about the moon? Like, how do we think about all of these uh all of these different issues. And um, no, the, my, my thing hasn't happened yet, except for it's sort of happening um, all around us now, right? Sort of the more we see companies go into space, but we don't really have an understanding of how does a company function versus how does a, um, like how do they work together, companies and governments? And in sort of this idea of space exploration and colonization, I think is really interesting. And I just think we're not doing 
I just think we're not being really thoughtful about the future really in any capacity, right? We're sort of like letting the future happen um, and not planning and thinking about like, like how do we want it to happen? And I think we often break down the argument into something that is very binary, right? Like dystopia or utopia. And it's like, well, it's going to be a mix of something in the in-between. But if we are aware of and like planful and thoughtful and sort of marching towards an idea of like what what a middle ground looks like, um, we could probably achieve it. But But that's really sort of, I think the essence of that piece for me is like, we have sort of abdicated our involvement in the future that we want to plan for. And as a result, we're, that's never going to happen, right? And this sort of response to that is like, we need to have unified conversations about what we would like it to be, like what kind of society we would like to live in, and then have people sort of plan and march against that rather than just having it happen in a way that feels um, organic, but in the organic nature of it, that it is largely um, dysfunctional and kind of capricious. I love that. I love that. I mean, I think that uh, typically in any area era, we kind of see a utopia for the rich and a dystopia for the poor. So that maybe that'll continue. <laughs> but it's interesting you're talking about space and, and companies because as SpaceX becomes a multi planetary company, which is likely to happen in the next five to 10 years or something like that. What does that look like? Who does it, who does Mars belong to when there's a private company colonizing it? Very interesting questions. Nick, I'd love to turn to you. I don't know what your chapter was about. Was it about biohacking? Because it could have been about biohacking. <laughs> Yeah, no, no. Uh, I sort of uh, left left the biohacking uh, to the side. I still do a lot of that. Uh, I I don't just talk. I don't talk a lot about it these days. I I did, certainly did at the beginning of of uh, me talking about futures and, and foresight. <clears throat> no, no. I've I've actually uh, got the got the honor of having like the opening chapter in the book, and it's called "Start with Dystopia." And it's it's not necessarily a view of the future. It's more about a framework to be able to understand what a terrible future could look like and how we could take information from the narratives that we create and the principles that we apply and the possible, you know, possible and plausible and preposterous states that could be there in the future and bring it back to today so we can make better decisions. So we've been living in a pretty dystopian world for the past year with the pandemic. And I always say to, to clients that the pan pandemics are one of the most modeled uh scenarios in in the entire foresight field we've been looking at this for years and no one's been listening and over the past year i've been absolutely slammed busy with consultancy working with clients and and my chapter really goes in to to flip my my positive view of the foresight development that i do with clients and flip it into sort of a dystopian mode so you know instead of thinking about an open future think about a closed uh, singular point future that actually benefits the few um, where they can profit from from all of us we become products and and really it's about absolute control and and these futures can really uh, help us work out okay how can we tell the stories who are the characters that are playing a part and i apply something called the monomyth or the hero's journey as part of my uh, as part of my process, um, th this this uh, chapter sort of sprung into life from a presentation I did at a conference in uh, Singapore, and I, I dialed into that remotely uh, back in uh, September 2019, and it was an offshoot of the World Economic Forum, and I sort of spoke about these dystopian futures, spoke about sci-fi, spoke about opportunities to really plumb the depths and wonder, you know, what if the world was going to be different and what if that world was going to be terrible and uh, this is actually proven to be something that's quite fervent in uh, my futures career as you probably know john i run a, an event called dark futures we've done six or seven seasons of that we've had over 40 speakers talking about the hidden systems in the world i think you know this is about opening our eyes and realizing that we've got different choices to make and and we can sort of opt in to the world that's being delivered to us very much like theo said you know the colonization of our lives by tech platforms by governments by by new systems and new cultural norms and and this is for us to to really realize that our current situation and a future situation that could be perpetuated by collaboration between these platforms and apathy by everyone on the planet could result in a world that's not very good and actually has got a limited uh, time span to it, right? So yeah. this is about breaking out of the thinking, uh, starting to think about dystopia. It's called Start With Dystopia because it's about wondering, you know, what's the worst that could happen? 
right? And then I actually- Total like, extinction. <laughs> yeah, well, no, but that's it, right? What's the worst that can have, happen? Like full thermonuclear war, you know, long, long, long range, uh, you know, mi um, nuclear missiles, are, are, you know, as something that's, that, that's like, like core to a defense conversation right now not necessarily mm -hmm. safety around the world and um yeah it, it's a it's a platform and it's uh it's a framework so uh you know i talk about everything uh f from that perspective and you know what what's the worst that can happen and what if we make terrible decisions really that is wonderful. Super interesting. I love this talk about colonizing uh, tech companies, colonize, colonizing us from the guy who's inserted technology into his very body. It's true. Um, but, you know, I got a little secret to tell you from Bronwyn. I mean, she told me that they put the worst chapters up first and it just gets better as you go, you know, so I'm like second last. So, you know, just not to, not to brag or anything, but, you know, um, Good on you. Uh, anyways, we're Thanks, gonna go to Duena. <laughs> we're gonna go to Duena next, and we are going to ask you, Duena, what is your chapter about? What did you do for this? Hi, none of this fun stuff. I'm slightly <laughs> envious that people are talking about um, machinery and planets and all kinds of very interesting stuff that I, I mean, I, I loved reading about and I'm getting to know you all. Um, my conversation is a lot more mundane. It has to do with um, essentially the role of humanity in the workplace going forward. And I've arrived there through a long and, and treacherous career uh, making technology um, in very mundane topics such as financial technology and uh, the struggle of attempting to make a better future uh, in terms of digital in banks. So a very... Um, interesting journey if you wish and my conclusion after a while um had become that and I, there was a book i wrote about this and then my conclusion was that uh, the reason we can't move any any faster and the reason we can't be building this genius future we're hoping for in terms of technology is that we have a lot of what i call human debt um, which is essentially all the things we haven't done for our humans kind of like technical debt but for um, the hr Love it. Things. Um, and so I left my uh, let's make product in technology for a while, looked at the topic, tried to understand what's happening from an organizational perspective, realized it's not to do with banks, it's the, the case for everyone, and that we have to make some very serious amount of change at an organizational level before we're going to make a better life for our humans at work, um, and started this company um, called People Not Tech, which ironically makes software because the future is still in technology without a doubt, but we can't be building a future around technology before we put the human back at the heart of the work process. And so, yeah, my chapter is about the importance of teams and where that is going. Um, and it, it's been, you know, a pleasure even realizing that this is an important topic to people that are looking at it, not um, as, a, as a theoretical thing that happens, it's fun, but also the very hard work of changing the way we interact um, to each other in the workplace. And that starts with kind of very um, hands-on things we can be doing in terms of the team's dynamic, in terms of um, how that reflects in, in uh, the new ways of work. And in fact, my chapter is written well before this happened. And um, all the conversation in it is something you would have heard 10 times on LinkedIn today only, um, because it has to do with the where of work. It has to do with how we work together. It has to do with examining outcomes as compared to sitting in an office and, and having command and control. And all of those things, um, yeah, I wrote them months and months before, but they were a pipe dream and a futurist dream at that point. They're an everyday conversation these days. So the world has undoubtedly moved quite a bunch. In fact, I had to reread it. And if it's any consolation, I wrote an entire book afterwards. And even that I had to reread and, and, and redo bits of because they just weren't current anymore. The conversation has taken such an incredible leap from the point of view of, of thinking of humans in the workplace that thankfully and hopefully if we carry this through um, over the next few years, we're going to see a lot of change. Well, two things, Duena. Thank you for explaining the uh, phrase behind your head, people not tech, because I was seeing the not tech, not tech, not tech. And I was wondering, what is the part that's on the other side of that? And also, you win the prize for best chair. Um, so <laughs> very nice, very nice. 
Ah, uh, let's go to Andrew. Andrew, um, you win the prize for a best background. I mean, you know, it's, it's flaming, and you have—I don't know if they're 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 chips on your chest or or <laughs> triangles. But tell us a little bit about what you wrote. I, I was going to say, you can't if you can't make out that that is A V for Andrew Forster, then I've completely failed in my mission. You failed. Just, Sorry. Oh, logo design. <laughs> completely oh, failed. Please, <laughs> stop right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'll pack up and go away. So interestingly, um, Bronwyn had mentioned at the top of the show that this whole thing kicked off back in around November 2019. And uh, unlike some other people who might have left their chapters to the last minute, um, I had some <laughs> time over over the Christmas period in 2019, and I, I bashed out um, my entire chapter around uh, 2019 coming up to uh, New Year. And it was on a topic that has been a passion of mine for a long time, although it's not something I work officially in. And that's the future of education, because I've believed for many, many years that our current system of education is fundamentally broken, not just slightly broken, but fundamentally broken. The way that we approach educating young people, just it doesn't set them up for life. It doesn't set them up for work. It doesn't actually set them up for anything unless you're churning out people that um, all think and look and act the same and are going to work in a factory, which is the basis of our current education system in most of the Western world. And, and this is an argument that my sister and I have been having for the last 40 years, because my sister is in her 60s, and she has been a teacher since she was in her early 20s. And I have argued with her ever since she became a teacher that teaching and schooling and education is broken right from then. Um, so I'd written this in my vision of the way that education could better be uh, delivered, actually then ended up being the world's biggest proof of concept the minute, the minute COVID hit. So it came to March when we had to review our chapters before final submission. And I went, it looks like I've just gone, yeah, do what we did in COVID. Um, because, <laughs> because basically we tested a huge amount of the things that I had put forward because my main points, uh, well, just high level is education is not something that takes place in a physical classroom. Firstly, education can and does happen everywhere. Every opportunity of life is a learning opportunity. One of my other points was also I don't believe in, in the concept that one person should be standing in the front of a physical room and teaching everybody in that room at the pace of the slowest person's ability to absorb the concepts. And there's a whole lot more as well. And, and although we, my, my sister and I have these really violent arguments with each other because she believes that nothing is as pure as the profession of teaching and standing in front of a classroom in a physical building, can't possibly do it remotely, um, one of my many arguments to prove her uh, or to in support of my side of the case was I interviewed the gentleman that uh, Bronwyn mentioned, R. Sam, the world's youngest official futurist. Um, he's the youngest official member of the World Futures Federation, Fu World Future Society. Can't remember which one, sorry. Um, and he is 12, 13 years old now self-educated. He has taught himself. His mother um, gave him a fundamental grasp of the English language, but he is a refugee. He speaks four languages fluently. Um, he has got an incredible IQ, incredibly articulate, and he's got this ability to be able to envisage um, multiple positive different parts of the future, although he's come through a very adverse childhood and upbringing, um, he's lived in refugee camps, he's moved multiple times in the world, it's an incredible bloke, and he's never ever set foot in a classroom, ever, wow. and yet wow. he's invited to come and speak to young people to get them to be able to think like a futurist, and so, well, all of his education has taken place outside of what we would call education. And I point to him and I go, 
there's just one minor proof point, but there's millions more, not only like him, but there's millions more um, children who have been raised in unconventional manners that are all so much better than what we've been doing for the last couple of hundred years in what we call traditional education. So as you can see, I'm fairly passionate about it. Hopefully it's going to get a lot of people either violently for or violently against. I don't care which, so long as it starts a conversation that hopefully moves us to a better position that we have been. And hopefully COVID has proved to a lot of people that there are different ways that education can take place other than what we've been doing. Let's see how many of those we can incorporate into ways of educating our kids in the future. Love it, love it, love it. And of course, it's going to be different for different people of different abilities, but nothing says buy a book like it's an argument with my sister and I had it in print. Um, awesome. <laughs> Doug, we're going to go to you and we're going to ask you, what did you write about? What are you passionate about? Okay, so, well, first of all, let me um, confess that uh, I'm a technology futurist and I'm a bit of a techno optimist. I don't uh, believe the future is totally dystopian. And, you know, a future world, one of our sort of philosophical standpoints is that um, the future isn't what happens to you. The future is what you create, what uh, what you make happen. So I think we have a choice rather than seeing the future as something that's thrust upon us. I think we have a choice to make the kind of future we want. So um, and the other uh, confession I must make is that uh, I write every week because I'm the editor of Mind Bullets. And uh, so we create these new stories from the future, these little scenarios about uh, business in the future and how that might uh, affect us um, today if we're doing some strategic thinking. So um, and and a lot of the subjects that have been touched on, of course, uh, uh, by the other speakers um, are things we've covered in, in some of these little scenarios that we write about. But um, I decided for my chapter to try and tackle something that was a bit more lighthearted and a bit more sort of um, different to, to the sort of big issues. Although when you think about it, it is a big issue because the big issues in life are the simple things like food, shelter, um, you know, money, um, education, and of course, transport or, or um, mobility, as they call it these days. So my chapter is all about um, the so-called flying cars, because everyone who thinks about the future, especially from a, a perspective uh, in the past, uh, thinks, well, you know, in the 60s, they promised us flying cars. And well, where are they? Well, of course, the, the real uh, answer is that we won't have flying cars, but we will have flying vehicles. They won't be cars because they won't drive on the road, but they will fly and I call them air taxis or passenger drones because that's the kind of technology that's going to um, do that uh, kind of Uber style uh, trips between us and the airport or between us and the city center, um, you know, from not, not from our homes. We're not gonna drive these things down the road and then take off to get over the traffic, but we are going to use electric vertical takeoff and landing uh, aerial vehicles to shorten our uh, journeys um, in the in the urban environment that we're moving into. So the, the the best example, of course, is you you land at the airport in Los Angeles and you've got to get to Hollywood, right? Now, if you've got to do that by car, it's a real real pain. And if you have to hire a helicopter to do that, it's it's hugely expensive and it's actually very inefficient. And helicopters are noisy; they need a lot of technical backup they're not ideal as, as a lot. urban vehicles yeah so so we've seen how drones have just completely you know uh, small drones and even commercial drones have just completely taken over because not because the, the technology didn't exist for or being able to do that sort of thing but it's it's improved so much now that the software basically flies it for you so so you can um you know even a kid can just take a drone and and just launch it and it'll just hover there and wait for the next command. You know, it's got all this uh, software that lets it be stable and all the rest of it. And the other thing, of course, about um, flying vehicles is that it's the electric motors that make them stable and safe because you can't, you can't have a drone that's powered by uh, petrol or, or jet turbines because you can't control them quickly enough. The, the electric motors can be controlled 
so quickly by the uh, feedback loops on the uh, software and the sensors that they can be completely stable and very co uh, controllable without relying on, on uh, highly skilled pilots and that sort of thing. So the, the, if you want an autonomous vehicle that flies, you've got to use electric motors. And so then you have the big trade-off between batteries versus payload versus um, the rest of it. And so it, it, it's a, it's a there, there, I think, I've, I've, I said, I think over 50 in my chapter, I said over 50 companies working on this. Um, I think it's over 60 now, but someone told me on Twitter, it's over 300 <laughs> companies are working on this, but not all of them are going to succeed, obviously. So the, the two that are really um, grabbing attention at the moment is Joby Aviation. They've got a, a tilt rotor um, aircraft that they've been uh, testing quite extensively and they've got huge funding and support from the uh, US Air Force. Uh, and the other one is Archer Aviation, which uh, they're testing a prototype which is subscale and they've uh, done a, a, a spec um, um, funding round with huge uh, valuing them at three billion dollars and they haven't even got a full-size prototype yet so wow. it sounds crazy but the 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 theory behind this is that when these vehicles become ubiquitous when when united airlines has got 200 of these things running between hollywood and los angeles airport and they're like uber then uh, this is potentially if you look at it globally this is potentially a, a trillion dollar business so it is uh, it is worth investing in if you believe that that is where the future lies and being a techno optimist i think ultimately it does lie in that direction to a certain extent we don't know exactly how it will pan out but i'm pretty sure that at some point in time we will have flying vehicles that carry four or five people from the airport to downtown or whatever and much cheaper and more efficiently than a helicopter uh, and kind of you know on demand like uber just tap on your phone and, and get a ride so so I think it'll happen. I don't know when it'll happen. I want game mode on there. So I have like a little laser and I can, you know, have little gunfights with the other <laughs> drones that are going around there. Um, but I absolutely love what you're saying because, you know, I get the pitches all the time. This is the flying car. The flying car is real now. And I go every time I go, no, it's not. No, it's not. And what you just highlighted yeah. is that flying car is the modern way of saying horseless carriage. <laughs> right? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> so it's, that's that's number one. It's not a car. You're not going to drive it on the road. You're going to fly in it, and you're not going to own it. That is yeah. the other thing. You know, the, the idea of the flying car is it was going to be like a personal vehicle. That's not going to happen. It's going to be like an Uber. It's going to be a service. It's going to be a, a, a an urban mobility service that happens to fly instead of drive on the road, and and that's where it really works. You know, as an interconnected, um, what they call multimodal. So you'll take an Uber. To get to the the heliport or whatever you call it and then you'll take the the air taxi to get to the the next uh, destination and and that's how it'll work you don't actually own these things in fact in the future when you've got all these uh, autonomous robot taxis i mean very few people are going to own cars really i think i mean it's pointless you know most of us own one or two cars and 95% of the time they sit in the garage or you know or in the basement at work and it's just idle capital i mean it's crazy yeah. Why, why do we do that? <laughs> so Doug is predicting a future in which we actually travel again, um, which I, I guess will come uh, at some point. We'll see how that happens. Uh, Bronwyn, um, we're going to start wrapping this up pretty soon, but uh, maybe um, lead us into a bit of a wrap, and I'll ask Theo for a bit of a wrap as well. Just uh, what you've heard today and what you've thought about the book, and, and maybe um, give people a sense of why they should take some time to, to, to get into this book and to enjoy it. Yeah, well, I think it's a quite a good point to pick up exactly where Doug left off about this whole fact that we're not going to sort of own our flying cars. And I think that that's really one of the questions that Theo and I were concerned about, that they, we don't have a stake in the future that we're heading into, the sort of base case, most probable future we are sort of sleepwalking into is one where both power and capital is owned by very, very few people and the rest of us sort of get to sort of rent a share in it, which is not very exciting and not very motivating for, for younger generations. We want to have a stake in the future so that we can look forward to where we are going and what we are doing. And obviously you've only just heard from a few of the different authors here tonight, but we've covered everything from genetic inequality as we 
stumble forward into that all the way through to warfare as we were speaking about today and my chapter talks about privacy and how we suddenly sort of thrown that one away so i've written a defense about in defense of imperfect information to give people sort of different options on how we can reclaim that future space and have a stake in it as individuals and as organizations because the book ha really has been written for for leaders people that are going to be able to actually put some capital put some time put their influence behind directing the sort of human ship the spaceship earth that we're all on towards a more participatory future rather than a future that's sort of dominated, as I mentioned, by those, those very big names with very, very big budgets that seem to <laughs> have positioned a kind of what seems to be to people an inevitable future. But the point is, it's not inevitable. We don't actually have to do any of that. We don't actually have to listen to the guys that are in the, the covers of the magazines. There are other options. We, we can sort of tell them we're not going that, that way. And hopefully if we get just a few people to say, hold up, we're not actually walking down that path. We actually want to go try something else. Then I think that we will have accomplished what we set out to do. I'm not sure love if you it. agree, Theo. Love it, love it, love it. I'm going to get to Theo in just a half a second. He's actually that way. Uh, I got to reverse yeah, cool. my directions here. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but um, love it. That was great. Very well spoken. By the way, uh, if I, I don't know that we all follow each other on Twitter, and I don't know if others follow, who are listening, watching, or will listen and watch this do follow us on Twitter, but Bronwyn has a very spicy Twitter feed, so you should <laughs> check it out. And you know what? Theo does as well. I mean, Theo, you had one tweet that had multi-thousands of retweets or something like that. Type, it totally uh, got into the zeitgeist on that one. Theo, wrap it up for us. Um just to sort of reiterate um, Bronwyn's point, I think that the future is something at the moment that is done to us, um, whereas we do have an active participation. Um, I think it's almost like saying that we are floating on a, a on a dinghy going down a, a very fast moving stream and we forgot that we actually have oars. So we can actually steer the ship. Can I get a motor? Uh, sorry? <laughs> <laughs> Can I get a motor? <laughs> uh, maybe, well, maybe if we, if we, uh, it has to be an electric motor, okay, and that way it can okay, fly. That's well. a concession to Doug. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it, but uh, you know, even touching on on something that Andrew um, uh, and Andrew's chapter as well is that we, you know, the the um, so the aim of the book was one is to arm you arm the reader with knowledge, to leave the reader with um, some sort of practical advice and how to actually think about the future um, and some tips on how to sort of think about a, as a futurist as well, that kind of mindset. But three, I think Andrew, what Andrew did with it, with uh, with our Sam is actually expose that we have an entire generation and generations that are following behind us who are already thinking like that. And, and I think we need to start looking to them, I think, um, and seeing how they think about and what they want us to build for them to inherit. So, you know, the, the, this book is kind of sort of multifaceted in, in that it provides warnings, it provides practical advice, and then it provides some, some kind of teachings to start thinking the way that we do as well. Love uh, it. So we might, not, we might not own cars, but you will own this book. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's not the shared economy yet, although no, there is a no, model in no. Amazon to get that. I think. Share anyway. the word, buy the book. <laughs> there we go. Excellent. I just want to thank everybody. Um, Theo Bronwyn, this was a ton of fun. Doug, you were amazing. Andrew, thank you so much. Love the tacos on your chest. That's amazing. They're not a Navy. Sorry. Uh, Duena, you were super impressive. Christina, thank you for your insights as well. Nicholas, always entertaining. It's amazing. You know, sometimes you have guests on a podcast and it's just like push play and they talk and we had like eight of them here. So you guys are all pretty incredible. Thank you for spending some time. We may make this a bit of a regular thing i don't know there's other authors from the book that didn't make it today and by the way it's pretty late for a lot of you you're in south africa or the uk or europe or other places like that thank you for doing that and if we do this every month or something like that and just hey what's new what's cool what's happening you know are my predictions being proved or am i a complete and utter idiot and i was totally wrong nobody ever says that right it's still coming the future is still coming trust me uh, anyways, thank you guys all. It was a real pleasure. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank Brilliant. You. Thanks. Cheers. Thanks, John. Great stuff. Thank you.